Do you ever feel you need a break from your filmmaking routine? Do you ever just want to jump on a plane, go to a new, strange, exciting city and make a new type of film? I do, all the time. The lockdowns and the travel bans and the stay at home of COVID just made me want to travel more. I desperately wanted to see more of the world, discover new places and tell new types of stories. This is going to be the first in a new series called Destination Film. I'm going to go to new and interesting places, meet the actors and filmmakers that work there, and try and capture what makes that city unique. Along the way, I'm going to share the process that I go through and what you need to know if you want to come to these places to shoot a film yourself. Today's destination is the magical metropolis of Montreal. So there are a couple of different ways to get from Burlington, where my studio is, to Montreal. First is to go straight up 89, which is just an expressway. Second is to drive through the Lake Champlain Islands, which I think is one of the most beautiful drives in the world. Uh, you recognize the causeway, which connects um, the mainland to South Hero from my car commercial that I shot. It's just winding roads across uh, bridges and through all these beautiful little towns. I don't really know what I'm gonna shoot when I get to Montreal. Uh, I've packed enough to pretty much have options. It is really wild to just be showing up somewhere to a strange city with a ton of gear and basically waiting for inspiration to hit. That's a missile base road. Well, this is intriguing. It does say authorized persons only, but that's a pretty old sign. I feel like if this was a real missile base, someone would be pointing a gun at me right now. It certainly doesn't look like a missile base. It looks like an abandoned aircraft hangar, but uh, I think I might stay this side of the wire and send my drone in. So this was an Atlas missile site. If World War III had been declared, the codes would have been sent to the guys in the bunker over there and these doors would have opened up and delivered nuclear missiles to Russia. So it's totally full of water now and it's contaminated. So the city's only using it as a solar farm. That is not what I expected to find in rural Vermont. Okay, well, that was exciting. I'm about two minutes from the border and as an Australian, I'm used to spending hours in customs and being asked every single thing under the sun. In the past, going through this border crossing, it's just a single lane road um, with Canada on one side and US on the other. And right, it usually takes about two minutes to get through. So fingers crossed, let's see how we go. It was all of a minute and a half getting through customs. This asked me if I had anything and I said, no. And they said, have a great trip. So I got a hotel in the center of downtown and I'm going to leave most of my gear except the camera bodies in the car so I don't have to lug all my gear up and down the elevators. To shoot a film I'm going to need three things, locations, a cast and a crew. I also want to meet people who work here and get a sense of the Montreal film scene. Montreal has been the location of hundreds of feature films. It is one of the big hubs of feature film and television production on the East Coast. Sometimes it plays itself, like it did in the De Niro heist movie, The Score. But more often, because of its wide range of architecture, it stands in for other cities that are more difficult, more expensive, or further away. Paris in Benjamin Button, New Orleans in Benjamin Button, New York City for John Wick, Berlin for Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Maybe it's the encounter with the missile silo on the way here, but I get really strong Cold War vibes from the city. I don't think I have time to shoot a whole film here, but what I think I could do is shoot a trailer for a film. I really like this idea because it's a low risk way of finding out what works and what doesn't work and giving yourself a ton of small problems to solve that hopefully lead to bigger things. That's the beauty of Montreal is that it's so diverse, not only in its architecture, but in its culture as well. Right? So you can really get away with anything in the city. 
you can really drive anywhere and there's something to that looks good, right? Like it's gonna look nice to shoot. As long as we're a small crew, no one's gonna say anything. One piece of advice that I would probably use to tell people that are coming from out of town to wanna shoot in Montreal, uh, whether it's small project or big projects, are you gonna come in the winter or are you gonna come in the summer? Winters are pretty harsh here. I mean, we've got a lot of snow, it can be really cold. Are you gonna shoot inside or outside if you're in the winter? The other thing that you could get lost in is just the amount of views you can find. You know, you have, look one way and you have new city. You look one way, you have old city. So you might be overwhelmed with all that kind of stuff. To shoot a film, I'm gonna need three things. Locations, a cast, and a crew. PS Base isn't in Montreal, but a site called Gigster has hundreds of locations that people are prepared to rent out by the hour for filming specifically. This one looks amazing. It is a mansion for $350 an hour. Let's jump in the car and check it out. This place was called Black Swain Manor. It's next to a cemetery and it was owned and operated by a production designer. So all of these incredible chandeliers and stuffed flamingos he sourced himself and he hires two productions. I use an app called Polycam on my phone to use LiDAR and the cameras to map the room in 3D. This is an absolutely amazing way to become familiar with a location and take it back to your studio and be able to try out different camera angles and lighting ideas uh, with a pre-made textured model of the location in 3D. As cool as Black Swain was, it was going to blow our entire locations budget um, on one two hour visit. So instead we decided to reach out to people on Instagram. We were able to find this awesome taco bar, uh, not far from downtown Montreal that we could shoot in during the day while they were closed. I also spoke to the management of the hotel I was staying in. And unlike a lot of places, they were happy for me to film in the, in the hotel with all my equipment as long as I didn't get in anyone's way. For our insert shots, we just stole locations, one on this parking garage looking back towards the city at sunset, and one after sunset in the casino. Bonus was, the casino has free parking, so this cost us nothing at all. I saw this on a postcard actually. It is the uh, Montreal Casino, and we just showed up to get some shots here, and we've been here for like 25 minutes and no one stopped us, so we managed to get some really very interesting footage. Shooting into the sun at sunset can be really tough. You have to choose between blowing out the almost the entire sky and holding any kind of detail in your subject. For this reason, I much prefer to wait for the sun to go behind the buildings. Then the sky is still warm, but not blown out. And you get detail in the buildings and you actually get quite a lot of ambient light and that cool backlight on your subject. Me and Seth, the cinematographer, were both gonna be in the shot. So we used this Axoon Cineview HE unit on the camera to broadcast the signal to a iPad that I had on a lighting stand. Axoon response for the video, but I don't think I could have got this shot without this because it means that you don't need a second director's monitor that you then have to power. You can just go off either your phone or your iPad or whatever you have handy to actually set up the shot, see exposure, see false color. It was actually a lifesaver. Our next shoot was the tequila bar. We had arranged to have the place for two hours before they opened. That meant that there would be a lot of sunlight coming in and we had to block that out before we could do any kind of lighting. For my inspiration, I was looking at this scene from Atomic Blonde, which seemed like a good way to use really strong, vibrant colors in the scene to make the actors really pop against the background. We lit this with the Nanolite Pavo Tube 230X kit. We had the four foot light as a key and the two foot lights uh, behind as backlights. The actors arrived in their street clothes. This was the first time I'd met them because I'd cast them online. We sat down, we talked over the scene. Coverage wise, we shot the woman's side first. I was already really happy with her performance. Then we turned around and got the guy's side. After we'd done two or three takes of both sides, we were able to push back and light it a little differently to keep the lights out of shot and get a two shot that we could cut to. It took about half an hour to set up. It took about 40 minutes to get our, all our coverage and it took about uh, 20 to 30 minutes to pull everything out again. So we were done right at five o'clock. I could have covered this with multiple cameras and potentially got both sides, uh, both close-ups at once, 
but then I wouldn't have been able to put the lights as close as I wanted and got the fall off that I wanted, got the dimension that I wanted. With a scene like this, with really uh, where lighting is a big part of it, I'd ra much rather shoot single camera coverage. One of the joys of Montreal is being able to get around relatively easy. So it was only a 10 minute drive back to the hotel where we were able to valet the car, unload all our gear into the bellhop carriage and take it up to the 15th floor where we'd set up our next scene. They had this outdoor lounge which had an amazing view of nighttime Montreal. We started setting up while it was still light and what you technically call blue hour. The key light was the Nanlite 150B in a softbox with a grid to control spill. And we moved it in pretty close to get the right ratios, the difference between the key and the fill side. Then we used a Nanlite Forza 60C as our backlight. Now I could have changed this to bright red or bright green, but I wanted to sort of keep it in line and not distract from the colors in the background. So we kept it at, I think 5,600 or 5,100. There was a lot of wind and rain on the day, which just goes to show you can't control everything, especially when you're shooting sort of outside or at least facing outside. There was actually a flash flood warning and we started quite late. And when you have wind like this, I think you just have to do a ton of takes. I think it was like six takes on the woman's side because her hair was blowing everywhere. We really couldn't control it. We're able to shoot our low wide shot when you actually saw the buildings while there was still some light in the sky and then we went in for coverage first on the man and then on the woman's side and got this great bokeh city sky background we used the ceremonic lav mics because the boom was just going to be too windy and got some nice clean audio despite the weather that may be true but we intend to use it to keep the peace and again with just two of us on the crew me and seth we're able to shoot the scene in just over an hour for two and a half pages. So I'm driving home from Montreal. There is one place I do want to stop on the way home and that's Mel's. This is the big studio complex here where they shoot a ton of Hollywood films, including big superhero movies. They have several different soundstage facilities. The one I want to check out is their new virtual stage. You may have seen this in YouTube videos. The producer there has offered me a tour. So I'm going to meet with him and check it out. We have a big LED wall and we shoot with the camera and, and uh, record uh, light. It can be done with uh, 2D plates or uh, 3D environments using game engines. There's definitely an immersive experience for the actors if they can interact with the environment. And then the, the ambient lighting, the lighting that comes directly from the LEDs that, that integrates the actor or the props uh, into the scene. There's a huge pool of artists, uh, visual effects artists. Um, then we have uh, Mel's here with over 200,000 square feet of a studio space. It's a very rich, rich city. So now that I've been to Montreal and shot there, who is it for? What makes Montreal unique? And why would you go and shoot a project there? I found Montreal very interesting and very difficult to categorize. It has spectacular locations. It has all manner of urban and rural, both new and old, all of which are very accessible and very affordable. But it has none of the iconic locations, Central Park or the Manhattan skyline or the Hollywood sign the places that you would actually go and shoot for. It is cheaper to shoot in than the big cities uh, of North America and of Europe, but it's still a large city in Canada where a hotel room will cost you a couple hundred dollars a night. So it is cheaper, but it's certainly not a cheap place to shoot compared to some of the other places I plan to visit as part of this series. Southeast Asia, parts of South America. And while it's easy to get around and easy to shoot in permit wise, that's really only true for seven months of the year. The rest of the year, it is covered in snow with sub-zero temperatures. So Montreal sort of fits in between space, between the big major cities with their deep pools of talent and iconic locations, and the more exotic, super cheap, super difficult places to shoot that I hope to visit and tell you more about. I really enjoyed my time in Montreal. I really enjoyed shooting there. It was a exciting and rewarding experience. And I hope if you get the chance to, you'll visit the city and check it out for yourself. It's a place quite unlike anywhere else I've visited. I wanna thank the sponsors of this episode, Saramonic, Nanlite, Axoon, and Tenba. Without their support, it wouldn't have been possible. The gear we used in this episode is in the description. Stay tuned for more Destination Film. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time. Thank you.